Why should um, anyone become interested in paleogeology? Well, geology in, in, in general, also plate tectonics, kind of is important for everything on this planet. So we, um, whether it's mineral resources, whether it's drinking water, whether it's wine or um, rocks for the road, it's all about geology, even diamonds uh, and so forth. So it's uh, one of the most important ingredients we have on this planet is the geology even for tourism, the mountains and so forth. So I can hardly think about anything which is not real to geology. And of course, that geology was formed in the past. We, we are looking, when you look at mountains in Norway, for instance, these are mountains actually formed some 400 million years ago. So we are looking at the past every day when you look out your window. It is the characteristic of the earth. Pan? It's the characteristic uh, yeah, of it, 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 This is, um, <coughs> well, on all planets, you know, it, it's the geology and the landscape, uh, which is the characteristics uh, also for Earth. What made you become so interested in this type of science? Well, it's probably coincidence what you do in life. I, um, when I started studying, I'd, uh, I, I used to prefer mathematics and physics, but when I started studying, I wanted to do something else. I looked in the catalog one day, that big catalog, which subject you want to study and so forth. And I saw a word I didn't understand. It said geophysics. It was the word geo. Okay, physics, I understood. So, so I thought, I'll do that. So, but first, uh, geophysics very broad. That could be meteorology, oceanography, but also the earth magnetic fields. So I actually started first taking courses in oceanography, but I got a little bored with that. So then I switched to what we call geomagnetism, and particularly how, not so much about the Earth's magnetic field today, but um, how it's been in the past and how it's preserved in rocks, rocks because each rocks, um, they preserved how the magnetic field was in the past. So that's caught my interest originally. Is there anything specific that you really want to know? Well, that's a lot I want to know. And of course, that changed through time. When you start off, you, when you know very little, you know, the, it, it's some sort of incremental, but the more you, let's say I started working maybe just with one continent, and then you want to do more of them, and then you want to do all of them, and then you also want to look beneath them. So what you want to know kind of changed with time. As, as more as you learn, there are barriers all the time, like 10 years ago, many barriers which are now gone, and then, and then you are looking for, for, for new barriers to solve. But anything specific at this moment? Uh, at this moment, um, well, what I've been working over the last decade is really to, to see how the, the mantle below the crust uh, interact with the place and so forth. But right now, uh, I'm trying to do something new again. You know, climate and paleoclimate is very popular, and um, uh, but I really want to try to understand how the climate on planet has changed over, let's say, the last billion years, the, the long-term variation, and not just the short-term variation. Uh, you know, in the last few hundred years, a few million years, I really want to understand what controls the big pattern, and and uh, that's a big challenge. If you go back in history, could you give a sort of brief history of, in geological terms, the Earth? Well, it depends how far you go back, but maybe the easiest is to go back to, um, let's say, 300 million years. That's very short. Remember, the Earth is 4.6 billion. But if you go back to 300 uh, million years, we, we had, what many are familiar, we had a supercontinent at that time where most of the continents were just one mass which we call the Pangaea. And uh, we know very well, or, well, still things we don't know, how that evolved through time. Um, so it was one continent, uh, and uh, let's say about 200 million years ago, the Central Atlantic started starting breaking this supercontinent apart. So there was North America and Africa departing from it. Uh, later on in the South Atlantic, open uh, a little younger, 130 million years, but uh, in my part of the world with Norway and uh, 
in the northeast Atlantic only started some 55 million years ago. So, so we do a lot of research to see how did this supercontinent break apart, also why did it break apart, it's, uh, even why did all the continents assemble into one supercontinent, they do that occasionally. Maybe every half a billion year or something, they come together and they go apart. So that, that's part of a, some sort of a long-term cycle uh, on our planet. Uh, let's just get back to um, the history of Earth. Um, what's so important about Earth or different uh, in terms of our solar system and the other planets? Uh, well, it's many things, but again, geology, plate tectonics is unique. It's the only planet we know in the solar system, at least the, the kind of Earth-like, the stony-like, or what we call the terrestrial planets, who has plate tectonics. So that makes us different from all of them. What is plate tectonics? Uh, that simply that, the pla that we are, plate tectonics is kind of simple in some way. If you, if, uh, it means we have about a dozen big plates, many small plates, and they move in relation to each other. Um, and also with plate tectonic, all the action is on plate boundaries, where things go apart and we have magma coming up, or when things collide, one plate go beneath another one, we call it subduction, and you can have a big volcanic chain, earthquakes along the margin. But the main thing is all the action, you know, in terms of seismicity, volcanism and so forth is happening on the plate boundaries. And um, there is um, no other planets that I'm aware of in the solar system. It could be on other planets, on exoplanets, but we don't know. So we are unique in that way. And um, we are here on Iceland, and mm. here, especially on Iceland, you can really sort of almost experience that. Huh? Yeah, Iceland is kind of double interesting because it's sitting on one of the plate boundaries where all the action is, so there should be a lot of volcanism, but normally uh, the, s the spreading in the ocean is beneath sea level, but here we are above. And that's because it's not just on a plate boundary where things spread apart, but we actually have a deep plume coming from very deep in the mantle, which is coming almost vertically up, and it's interfering with the, sp with the, with the plate boundary here. That's, got, that's why we get this buoyancy from beneath, and we have this elevation. So, so Iceland and one other place on the planet are unique in the way that uh, you see this, you see seafloor spreading. It's like dry on land. You actually see it instead of being in the ocean. So, Iceland is is very very special. And why is plate tectonics so important? Well, you. Uh, <coughs> In, well, first of all, it's um, visually, it's uh, our landscape is a result of it, but also our natural resources. Basically, all what we consume of, of minerals, oil and gas, and so forth, uh, are the product of plate tectonics. So, without it, there wouldn't be any cars. We we need something to build this thing, and we need something to fuel it. Maybe in the future we have other means, but still, you need. You need minerals, even if you're going to turn into batteries and so forth. You, that's extracted from rocks. Again, it's geology and plate tectonics who, who actually, in some way, you can, you can say, um, gives us all the resources to do what we want on this planet. The strange thing about it is that sort of we are living on a recycling planet in terms of it's, it's continuously changing. Continuously changing, and that's why when when you, it, would you mind. Yeah. Starting with that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's um, the, the surface and the landscape because of plate tectonics is continuously changing. Of course, it's slow, but let's say over a few hundred million years, you have a totally different surface again. And um, when you look at the other planets, there you see really the old history in the beginning. You know, you can see more than four billion years of history because in, in the early. Um, in the early beginning in the solar system and planetary formation, the, you had heavy bombardment uh, impact. You have craters uh, everywhere, and um, you see them on other planets, but on Earth, they're all gone, because everything has been recycled. And with plate tectonic, it's been kind of pushed into the mantle when one plate is um, pushed beneath another one. So uh, you, you're resurfacing 
the landscape is changing all the time. Like uh, in one period, let's say Greenland was totally underwater, now it's above water, and all this is changing. It's a dynamic system all the time course of plate tectonics. Otherwise it would just be a static system where everything was stuck where they are. You have been studying plate tectonics all your life almost. Um, what do we not know about plate tectonics? Well there's a lot we don't know and um, for, for instance uh, when uh, before plate tectonics when it was called continental drift which Wegener proposed more than a hundred years ago um, it, Various reasons why people didn't like it, but let's say physicists said, for instance, oh, we have no drive. What is the driving mechanism? How, how are these plates moving around? And it's interesting, even when plate tectonics in the late 60s, it's like people stop asking that question. Why are, what are the driving forces? And um, so plate tectonics is really just, we, we just look at this little lid on the planet with these plates and we can map them out, we can see how fast they're moving and how they collide, we can reconstruct them back in time, but we don't really have a full understanding how this is interacting with the, with the mantle. So that's, uh, how is the convection in the mantle beneath the plates um, being important in driving these things? But also, when slabs are going in, there is also a driving forces from plate tectonic itself, from a slab going in and pushing the continents with it. So it's this interaction between what is driven from below and what is driven from the plate itself, which we, which we, we don't really know in detail. We don't know why. No, we don't know why. So that's, uh, that keeps us um, scientists busy. You know. it's a, of course it's a curiosity driven, you know, why? You know. It's like, it's the life on other planets. We, we want to know why is this happening. <laughs> It, it sounds so strange. If, if, if you have to look at the Earth, I mean, you have this core, and you, as if the continents are floating on a sort of heat mass. Can, can you describe a little bit how thick should I imagine yeah. these continents? Well, well, normally when we talk about crust, uh, it differs. Uh, in if you are beneath the continents, the, the crust uh, is about 35, 40 kilometer. Um, but if you're in the ocean, it's only maybe. Well, on the spreading which it's zero, the whole mantle is coming up, but it's much thinner, about five kilometers or so. But that's not the moving plates. Also, the upper part of the mantle, what we call a stenosphere, uh, makes what we call tectonic plates. So you can say the tectonic plates, uh, the, te the continental continent, um, tectonic plates are about, let's say, 300 kilometers or something. So that's about the plates. And they are moving over a part of the mantle because of um, temperature or pressure. You, you, it's, it's more viscous there, so these more rigid, stiff plates can, can move on this um, mantle material. So you can, you can think about a mantle. It's, it's a slowly convecting system over geological time. But, uh, but uh, this convection could maybe be in the order of three, four, five centimeter per year. So it's, it's a slow grinding process. Now we are here in Iceland. Here mm. you see that this oh. inner... Mm. Have a drink. You have a drink, yeah. Have a drink, yeah. 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 You want some more? Ah, Shall I pour in? Very good. Okay, so, lamp here. Yeah. so we are here in uh, Iceland. Here it's quite apparent that you know this heat, this this mass coming out yeah, of the ground. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, and um, with Iceland, we we um, because of this, uh, it's unique because of this what we call the Iceland plume, and also how they are linked. What the feedback with plate tectonics? Yeah. What's the Ice Iceland plume? So, um, well, there is, um, like I Iceland and Hawaii is another example. Maybe there is about, some might say there is about 50 of these. I don't think, maybe about 25 of you have these, what we call deep plumes, who actually come all the way from um, the very deepest mantle, 2,900 kilometer down. And we can actually follow the, we can see them on, um, we call seismic tomography or imaged of the earth 
using seismology. And um, Iceland is one of these who comes all the way. And uh, one of the things, kind of outstanding problem, how does these maybe 25 or 30 deep plumes, how, how do they how do they start their journey f from the deep earth? And uh, how, how can they influence plate tectonics, for instance, is um, also one of the outstanding issues that we are working on. But we think we are, we, we get s s a little handle on this now. Is that what you call super volcanoes? Or? Uh, <coughs> originally, at the moment, it's not a super volcano, it, mm -hmm. even though it's big and there's a lot of flux and volume. But uh, when it started, when, when these, what we call hotspots, you might call them uh, normally in the literature, when they start, the first time when they erupt, they, they are very often um, linked to a really massive, popularistic, you can call them super volcano, but in the, in the science uh, language we call them large igneous provinces, or lips, that's kind of the, and um, so when, when they first start, but, uh, it's, get a catastrophic melting of the upper mantle and you get really big super volcano. And Iceland hotspot started like that, but that's about 60 million years ago. But when, so then it didn't, wasn't just confined to a, to a little island like Iceland, actually covered vast areas of Greenland, Scotland, Ireland, a little into the Norwegian shelf. So it maybe had a radius of something like 1,500 kilometers, maybe 2,000 kilometers. So that, that's what we call a super volcano, and you do not want to be around when one of these erupts. Are they still of importance for us? Yeah, they, they, uh, well, some are worried it might happen again, but let's say in the last 500 million years, there's only 30 known episodes. And the youngest one you find in, um, in North America, it's called the Columbia River Basalt. It's about 50 million years old, but the hotspot it's linked to, like Iceland, is what we call Yellowstone. And uh, the, the, often they make some sort of disaster scenario if you have another Yellowstone. Yellowstone is erupting again, but Yellowstone is tiny in terms of aerial distribution, which produced this Columbia supervolcano, maybe about 200,000 square meter. But, uh, for comparison, one in Siberia, about 250 million years ago, was five million square meter. And that one actually affected life on, on, on Earth. And maybe 90% of all life died because of the supervolcano. So if it happens again, it's definitely something to worry about. They're quite violent processes. They're very okay. violent, and uh, luckily they're very rare. Um, it, an interesting specific um, area is uh, diamonds. What yes. about diamonds? Yes. But, <clears throat> and it's, it's kind of linked to the same story. We have this... Um, I, I have been working many years with this hotspot and uh, supervolcanoes and try to kind of reconstruct them back in time. And uh, when we did that, we noticed they came from certain areas deep down. Uh, could yeah. you maybe start with the diamond story because I'm yes. introducing it now? Yes. So, yeah. so, so um, the, di the diamonds, uh, they are, s you, you only find diamonds in continental crust and they're sitting at uh, great depths because it's the, you need the right pressure and temperature to actually to, to form a diamond. So they are sitting at... Uh, 180, 200 kilometer depth. But they are brought up to the surface by um, something called kimberlites, which, which is also, um, it's a flow of warm material coming from deep earth, probably also very deep. And they pick up the diamonds and bring them to the surface. So on the surface you can, you find it what we call kimberlites. It's a big circle, it looks like a crater. And that's, that's where all the, or most of the diamond exploration is, because they bring, so kimberlites are like the elevators of diamonds, and they come very fast. Um, because if you bring a diamond up very slowly, it turns into graphite, which we use for pencil, and then it has no value, no real value. So the reckon from about 180 kilometer depth, you bring a diamond to the surface maybe in three hours. So you don't want to be, so this will come very fast. It will be a big splash of water and CO2 
uh, when, you, when, when it's brought to the surface. But it's a long time. It, it, that luckily doesn't happen every day either. So. But in fact, you say the earth is filled with diamonds somehow. It is, and uh, we, um, we, we, we know where we should find them, and, uh, and uh, we have an idea where they should be in relation to the mantle for these, uh, these hot, f uh, hot fluxes to bring them up. So we have a reasonably good idea about where they are. And the only thing is you can't mine them. Uh, well, you, not down there. How far did you, do you have to go then? Well, you have to go to 180 kilometers if you want to mine them in situ. But so, we, so again, nature, you know, is, is doing us a favor. It's bringing these two things to the surface. Um, you also are very deep into paleomagnetism, mm. um, trying to uh, establish a new revolution in, uh, in well, paleogeology, paleo... Uh, Paleogeography. Yeah. Um, can, can you explain what these revolutions are and what the next revolution should be? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I always say there are three revolutions in geoscience so far, and it started in 1912, 1915 with Wegener, and but he died very unhappy in the 20s. Nobody believed him, and you had to wait to the 1960s before before people took up this issue again. Um, when they had a second revolution. Uh, could you maybe, uh, so, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, um, tell shortly what, what his revolution was, actually. Can you have a drink, please? Oh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> so sorry about the voice. Nobody, of course, knows. No, no, no. That's okay. Nobody knows, of course, what the revolutions are, so yeah. it's good to, yeah, to yeah. just sort of sh briefly describe yeah. it. So uh, let me ask this uh, yeah. again. Um, you're specialized <coughs> in paleomagnetism, and actually mm. you want to sort of, well, bring forth a fourth revolution in, in um, mm. geology. What are those revolutions? So the first revolution is more than 100 years ago, about 1912, 1915, with Wegener. And um, what he suggested, uh, if you look at Earth today, the continents are spread around. So what he said, once upon a time, but he didn't really say in million years, uh, you, you have to start guessing here. Uh, he said, once upon a time, all the continents were together in one supercontinent. And he, he, he actually didn't call it Pangaea, which is known as, which is called all land, but he called it Urkontinent. He was German. So he said, once upon a time, they're all together. And uh, in quite recent time, actually, in what we call tertiary, they, they, they broke apart. But he called it continental drift. And uh, they just start moving. But, um, you know, he didn't know about the oceans. They were never mapped out. What were that? So they looked like they were just plowing through the ocean and driving forces was unknown and so forth. But, but that's a really important revolution. Um, but to understand the oceans, there was not just continents. That's why this was called continental drift. There was nothing about oceans. But in the early 60s, when they had mapped out the ocean, they saw from bathymetry, they saw this, what we now know it's spreading axis between plates, they mapped this out. So, so that somebody then figured that there might have been magma coming up from the mantle and pushing plates aside. So then you also had this aspect of ocean. It wasn't just continent. There was a mechanism here. Maybe now you are pushing plates apart and you're pushing the oceans, making new um, oceanic crust. That was in the early 60s. Um, but the third revolution, what we call plate tectonics, was actually in the middle late 60s. And, um, and that's, that play instead of continental drift, just continents moving around, it's called plates because uh, it's a mixture of continents and oceanic crust and they have plate boundaries. And they, they put mathematics on it, described it. You have a rotation pole somewhere and it's rotating with a certain you know, velocity and so forth. And when you got that mathematics on it, then you, could, then you can run it forward. I look at Earth today, we know how it's moving. I can predict what the Earth would look like in 50 million years. Or I can predict, uh, go back in time, what did it look 100 million years ago and so forth. So that was the fourth one. But again, plate tectonics is what I will call a, it's a kinematic theory. It's just describing what these plates uh, are doing on top. But 
uh, what, what I'm interested in, uh, what are the driving forces and how, how does they fit in with these hotspot and plumes? You know, is there a relationship uh, between them? And it's more a, making a grand theory. Maybe in physics you can, you know, Fis has been dreaming about unifying quantum mechanics with, with general relativity, you know, making it into one grand, you know, theory, you know. In some way, that's what we want to do with Earth. We want, to, we want to link the full understanding of what's happening on the surface, what's happening beneath us, uh, all this heat and the plumes and so forth, into one unifying theory. So, so that's where we, and, and kind of the name we have put on this preliminary, we call it mantle dynamics. So, so we get a mantle into this as well, you know. Hmm. So uh, that, that's kind of the grand vision. So the third uh, revolution was plate, plate tectonics. Was yeah. the third? Yeah. Pam? Uh, well, that was the third. That was the third one. Yeah. Okay. And the fourth is going to be. That's what we we used to name mantle dynamics. You know. Okay. And that will be when we fully understand this planet. Hopefully, in my lifetime. Because that's what you want. Yes, I want. But it's uh, it's uh, we still have some way to go. Yeah. Mm. Suppose you succeed in doing that, what would that mean in terms of humanity or in terms of knowing about the Earth? What, what would it mean for us? Well, whether it means so much for the normal person in the street, I don't know. I'm driven by curiosity to understand and I've also been interested in history. I want to see how things change and, and how, how it will be in the future. But uh, whether it has you know, enormous practical value for, for the ordinary human being. That's a different story. But would it learn us something about, well, the future of the Earth? Or what will we, can we learn? I, <coughs> it, it will, well, it, everything tells us about the future of the Earth and we could do prediction. The problem, these are so, when, when, from these models, we can predict things, but we talk about tens and maybe 50 and 100 million years prediction, you know, so, so that's why it doesn't have that immediate, you know, it doesn't have an effect for what's going to happen next year or in the next century f for what we are doing. We're, we're talking about on a time scale, which for most humans, is, you, you cannot count so much. So. But the other thing is you want to relate it to, for example, climate or those kinds of things. Yes, the, the, the long-term climate is, when we get some reasonably good control on this, we will, um, we will um, see how we can understand long-term climate because that's another thing we do not fully understand. Um, but we, 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 well, we live in an ice age, okay, and in and out we have a, but basically, what we are in a, in a cold or ice uh, house condition. But that's only happened three times in the last 600 million years. It's very unusual. The, we, we are talking about global warming and we, we are afraid of greenhouse ga gas and too much CO2 in the atmosphere. But that is actually the normal status for our planet. For the last 600 million years, that has been the normal condition, much higher CO2. Uh, much higher, fluctuating sea levels, but at time much higher, uh, warmer. So we actually live in an unusual time. And actually the origin why the planet goes into an ice age is still heavily debated, uh, also among uh, climate experts. So that's something I would kind of try to get a handle on. Uh, let's, let's recall this. Um, you say we are living... I'd like to sort of make that into a story. You say we are in an ice age, but it might be interesting to mm. indeed tell, okay, we are in an ice age. Yeah. And in fact, it has only happened. Um, mm. Let me recall it. You say we are in an ice age. What, what, what do you mean? Well, it's generally, it's, it's a cold climate. And uh, also, generally, um, low CO2 in the atmosphere. Because to, to, to go into a cold climate or an ice age, you, you need uh, to have low CO2, atmospheric CO2. 
<clears throat> and that has, um, and we can, of course, when you are in an ice age, you find, you find the, in the Glossko record, you, you find evidence for that. You find the glacial deposits, all the, and uh, if you look back in time, we, um, we have to go back to about uh, 300 million years when we had the previous one, and before that, it's about 450 million years. So we, we know from the Glossko record when you had these things. And climate scientists would, without really knowing the reason, would simply say, oh, we have them because we had low CO2. But I'd like to know why did we, why, why do we have this fluctuation in CO2? And, um, you know, it, I find it unsatisfactory just to say, oh, we got an ice age because the CO2 level was, was low, you know. So you had the conditions to, to, um, to get glaciers and so forth. So um, that's something I would like to push you. Because in fact you're saying we are living in an extraordinary... Extraordinary time. We are really living in an extraordinary time. And, and that's something, I, you know, in all this debate about uh, man-made climate change for the sun, uh, when I try to teach students whether that is correct or not, it probably is, but I also wanted to leave my lecture room with a full understanding we live in a very unique time. Uh, and this is not how our planet normally was. It was much warm. We lived in greenhouse condition with much higher CO2 level. Could have been 10, 15 times higher than what we have now. And we don't really, we don't really understand this CO2 fluctuation through time. Is that something you would like to sort of grasp or? That's something, and uh, I have a, it's very complicated to do it, but again, plate tectonics become important. We, we have to know exactly, because the distribution of continents and oceans through time, the distribution of uh, where you have subduction sounds and, and you, you, you have volcanoes associated with it, because um, Magmatism is an important thing, and we have to map it out in detail. And then I have to know, I have to know the paleography in super detail. I have to know where all the plate boundaries, how, how much potential volcanism can you have, and can we calculate that in to, 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 to give an idea about how much CO2 is released from this. So again, that needs extremely precise knowledge of how the, how the plates and, and the distribution of continents and oceans through time. So that's my big goal. And I want to do that for the last billion years. Because also, uh, in what we call Precambrian, at about 700 uh, million years ago, th there, are, there are some postulates that actually the whole Earth froze. They call it a snowball Earth. Actually, the entire Earth, even the equator, had glaciers. So, so that's definitely a very spectacular planet at that time. It's, uh, it's controversial, but there are some evidence this can happen. But it, it again, it's typical just to say, oh, we had low CO2 level to permit us to do this. So um, that's my kind of next goal, let's say, for the five, five, ten years, something like that. But I need a lot of young postdoc, PhD students who have to plan this out. So. Aren't you surprised by, let's say, the strength of the Earth somehow that, that, you know, you can have all those fluctuations and Earth survives somehow? It does, we know that, but the, the problem, uh, let's say, we think about global warming, um, is that it is going quite fast, you know, you, every 10 years you, you can follow a curve, even though the variation, let's say, in sea level is quite small compared to, you know, a, only 100 million years ago, the sea level was more than 200 meter higher. But it's go quite fast, but, uh, but we, we, in geological time, we, don't know, we, we cannot measure at that precision. We cannot do on a hundred year. We, we might date rocks maybe just to a million years or something. So it's very hard for us to see how fast actually natural processes are compared to what we can measure right now since the Industrial Revolution. So, but uh, I have a feeling the planet is pretty good, you know, helping itself, saving it. That there are feedback mechanisms. If you do something, you, there is a feedback in some systems. So, so maybe if we are positive that uh, 
earth will take care of itself, unless it goes too fast that it actually will run out of control. But is it something you worry? or? I'm not worried about it. Mm. I'm not sleepless about but that's also because there are many other things on this planet you should worry about. I'm not going to ask what. <laughs> <laughs> what? Huh? What? No, but that, yeah. could, that could be overpopulation yeah. or running out of resources. And um, sometimes I say, you know, humans, animals normally kill because they have to eat. And I say humans are probably one of the cruelest animals, you know. We, some some kill just to kill, you know, and uh, I'm more worried about that than global warming, to be honest. Um, let's talk a little bit about your institute and the way you, you uh, let's say, um, uh, well, have your students around. Um, you have a, a sort of reputation in taking students uh, on a nice trip and make science nice for them. Yeah, for me, maybe one of the most important for me for me is to for uh, educating young and stimulating young postdocs and for them to get grants and maybe become a professor themselves. So, so uh, <clears throat> for me, always the social aspect is not, you know, you talk to your professor and you close your door and you don't, uh, I'm always been very, um, the social interaction with the students and postdocs. So, so I take them on boat cruises and actually, it, we do it at least once a year, and um, since I'm in Oslo now, we do it from Oslo to Kiel in Germany, Oslo, Copenhagen, so. But we have conferences, and many times we let the young present, so it's not the old professors that kind of sit in the back, and we let the young people run the show and feel they're important, and uh, we, 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 we always are very social. And celebrate science also? And celebrate science and discuss science and so forth because the brain never stops working, so it doesn't switch off at five o'clock. What about the relation between whiskey and uh, geology, in your terms? No, that's very important, but that's, um, in, uh, since I was trained by Scottish geologists, and ge geology is a very, it is very so social compared to many other sciences. And, and after a good 12, 14 hours a day, it's always, Good to have a nice single malt whiskey too. Um, somehow you, you could say um, we should know the Earth history by now. I mean, we've been studying it for years and, and years, and um, but somehow we do not even seem to be close. Oh, I, I think we get closer, uh, at least in. And in, uh, in what our group are working, I, I think we made a lot of progress. A lot of things, uh, only 10 years ago, I wrote a proposal to solve something and I actually didn't have a clue how to do it. And suddenly out of the blue, we, 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 we saw the answers and we moved on. So, but there's a lot of things we don't know and a lot of phenomena, a lot to study. So you, you will never know everything, and, but then you don't, need us any longer if we if we know I actually had a professor once who, who very often claimed to me now I know everything and I looked at him and said and maybe you should retire then if you know everything you know what's the point um, so it's it's all all this issue you don't know who drives us forward you know curiosity driven science um. You even seem to have a, uh, discovered a new continent. That's what I read. Oh, a lost continent. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, that's kind of, it's started a little hobby really, you know, that we, we start wondering uh, in the Indian Ocean, is it all, uh, there's a lot of volcanism and hotspot and plumes and so forth, but we start wondering if there could actually be some continental fragments actually which was buried by these lavas. So, um, so, so we, we discovered first one in, uh, in beneath Mauritius, which is a volcanic island, very young, only nine million years of lavas, but we think now there is, it's partly 
covering an old continent um, of continental crust beneath it. And um, that generated a lot of, uh, for me it was like a hobby project, but we got, uh, never got so much media attention because this is, you know, lost continents. Um, it has some sort of feeling for, for people. And it actually got so bad with, I was phoned by journalists and that people wanted to film that I actually had to take three days off. I just went home and shut the phone off. And, um, but it was fun. To, remember I was interviewed by BBC and they wrote a little story and the next day I got an email from BBC and they said, wow, you got 1.6 million who clicked on this interview with you. But then was the bad news, she said, but it was only the second highest you were beaten by the Oscars. Unfortunately, it was the Oscar winners that day. But she said, we, and also uh, in Nature, um, they, they, they wrote a little review about our paper and it was the 10 most read paper in Nature that year. So I remember we are, we are competing with all other sciences, medicine, whatever, you know. So see, we were, we were quite proud of that thing. And the explanation? Well, the explanation uh, is, is a little complicated, but it, it's not very complicated. Um, Mauritius today, it, it is a volcanic island it's sitting out in the Indian Ocean, but um, if we go back in time, this little fragment, which is actually part Madagascar, which is um, towards Africa, was a little fragment of uh, Madagascar, but it, uh, it, it was one of these plumes would come and, and broke this little piece away, and then it was later covered with lava and it was just parked in the middle of nowhere. But you know, there was one island, even, even, um, even, even Darwin had seen that, you know, Seychelles. You know, that's, that's an island in the middle of the ocean and that's a, that's a continental crust, piece of fragments, but it's not fully, it's only partly covered by younger lavas. So there, there you're actually walking on real granite. So, so in some way, that's kind of spurred our interest. You know, we, we have this Seychelles, this little microcontinent in the middle of nowhere. Could there be more of this stuff? And then we also did a similar story for Iceland. We, so uh, we, we introduced another complication to Iceland. Not only it's sitting on a, on a plate boundary spreading, we have a plume coming all the way from the continental boundary, but it's also a piece of continental fragment beneath Iceland as well, just to make it very complicated. It sounds as if the Earth's crust is a sort of crack piece of, you know, stone and all kind of other stuff, mm. but it's a sort of crack -a Yeah, but it's, uh, I, I call it a puzzle, you know, you have to get all these pieces together and, and, uh, and it can be mildly complicated, but and in, but interesting. Yeah, okay. Yeah? So um, can I have some more water? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. What do you say? The, 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 well, there's one yeah. thing I, I, I would like to do one more. One, yeah. It's more an explanation thing. Um, could you maybe sort of dis try to describe how this is working? I mean, in terms of, okay, you have this first continent and then you have, you know, it breaks up and, mm. and things come up and they go down just in a sort of brief uh, story. I'm going to do that. Yeah. So yeah. could, could, could you try to describe how actually sort of in terms of almost a filmic epos, how this yeah. is working actually? From breakup of Yeah, yeah, continent. yeah. So you have, you have, yeah, you, yeah. we start with the first continent. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, it's a, <coughs> well, the way I look at it is um, when, when we had this um, one supercontinent, Pangaea, and uh, big question, how do you break it? Okay, so you have these plates together, and um, the, the way we look upon it, this is where this heat from plumes coming from, the, from deep earth, so, so they are coming underneath parts of this supercontinent, and they actually weaken the crust, and it actually breaks things apart. <laughs> Yeah. You might have to interrupt. Maybe it's yeah. good to start with the core. Okay, you yeah. have a metal, and uh, yeah. uh, let's say go from the inside out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just as a sort of to yeah. have an idea. Okay. So on the 
in a very deep mantle on the core, uh, on top of the core, there actually there are what, what we found out there are two areas of uh, of hotter material. They, they are like reservoir, probably very old, primordial, maybe from the origin of the planet, and. Um, from these, from the margins of these piles of material, this is where these plumes develop, like the Iceland plume. So, and they get triggered by some mechanism. Um, so they start slowly uh, ascending, and, and that's a very slow process. That could be 20, 30 million years. When, when they reach the surface, um, and they are hotter than a normal mantle, uh, it leads to a catastrophic melting, and they find themselves into cracks and so forth, and actually breaks plate apart. This is how we look upon how the, these plumes are coming slowly up, and they break plates apart. So that's how we, we and that's probably how you broke this supercontinent apart, because it it wasn't it didn't break all at once. It was in different areas, and you can ask, it, why did it start there and not there? And, but before, before it breaks, like five million years before that, they were always hit by one of these, these plumes which came from the... So this is where this heat, it weakens the lithosphere and breaks the surface plate. So, so there you see the interaction of how processes in the mantle, heat coming and plumes, and how they actually, they modify the plate boundary. They make new plate boundaries. And, break them apart and start driving it. Um, but we don't know all the details, but uh, in kind of... And then the feedback back again, so these things are going, and, and then uh, you have material which is, which is subducting into the mantle, which is slowly sinking, what we call slabs. That's very slow. Uh, might take 150 million years before it reached uh, lower. And that could actually be the triggering to these plumes. You get this colder material coming down, and it triggers along this margin of these old reservoirs. Uh, it triggers, makes some thermal instabilities, and, and makes this thing rise. But of course, all this is modeling, is theory. Nobody has been there, um, so um, so there are different opinion on this. Yeah. Uh, I have my opinion, so that's why I move on and uh, go to climate now. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, could you sort of give this idea of this recycling and changing, continuously changing of the Earth's crust and the, let's say the surface of the Earth? Yes. Yeah, so, um, well, first of all, all, all the seafloor is recycled all the time. Remember, if you look at planet Earth, two thirds of the planet is water, which is essentially where you have seafloor. All that gets subducted into the mantle. So the old, let's give you an example, the oldest seafloor, when you look at the planet today, is about 180 million years or so. And everything older than that has been recycled and pushed into the mantle. When it comes to the continents, you, there is, they, they are more buoyant. They don't really want to be pushed down into the mantle. So, but there you see the effect that um, you, you, f you find mountain buildings like him. Himalaya, say India collided with Asia, and you, you see the mountain building, the, de the deformed rocks and the structure. So, but uh, the most dramatic is actually the, since the planet is two thirds is oceans that, that get recycled all the time. So, the oldest one we can look at in the oceans today is 180, maybe 190 million years. And that's tiny. I don't, it's like. It's an, less than 10% of Earth history. So. And that makes it trouble for us, because when I make plate tectonic models, which are older than 200 million years, I have to make up the ocean, because I need plates. I have to make artificial spreading and in some sort of which makes sense to me. So, and um, that, of course, has a strong component of philosophy. We just have to obey certain physical laws and geometry and so forth. But you are basically a little Bambi on the ice when it's older than 200 million years. In fact, you're studying the recyclability of stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is a big problem. So plate tectonics is troublesome for us because there is this recycling all the time. And it's very, very hard. That's why I'm, 
My dream is maybe to understand uh, in some detail the Earth for a billion years, but of course a lot of that I have to make up because all the oceans are recycled all the time. So I only are left with this one third of the planet, the continental crust, which is deformed in various processes. And that's because that's where I have to see the signals to, to reconstruct the planet. So you plan ahead hmm? a billion years? You plan ahead? I plan a billion years, at least, and I think that's about 25% of Earth history. And, and I think that's it. There are people who try to go further, but it becomes very fragmented, and very little data. So what about Iceland? How, how should you imagine this column called Iceland? Yeah, well, again, it's a little special um, because normally if, if we were on the seafloor now and on the, this spreading boundary, it would only make a uh, crust maybe uh, five, ten kilometers thick. Uh, and of course, uh, Iceland is actually much thicker because it has this extra plume. So the thickness here can be extreme up to... It's not just that it's a thin thing and it's bubbling beneath. You actually have an extreme thick pile of lava, which could be maybe up to 35, 40 kilometers, some claim. So it's actually almost like continental crust because you've got so much input of lava that has been piling on top and the top. So, so, so here you have a very, very, very thick pile of lava. But of course, um, in areas where you have the rifting today, it, not far down there, you, you do have bubbling uh, lava, you know, just waiting to explode and decompression come up. So. You sometimes call it the plumbing system. Huh? Huh? You sometimes call it the plumbing system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, well, it's, uh, well, it's a very complicated system of uh, where you have magma reservoir and chambers, and hmm. you don't always know how it's going to find its way to the surface, but uh, here in Iceland we, we do a pretty good where, where the, the dormant central volcanoes are and, and you know that's where the, you can see that on the geothermal fields and we can use that to turn it into electricity. So That's what they do here. Yeah, but like, you know, most people wouldn't build a, a power station on top of a volcano, but you know they, they do it here. They are used to, well, it's, Iceland, is it? Is that life? You, you never know what's going to happen, so, but they have experienced that for thousand years yeah. on this island. And They're used to it. And it's still prospecting. But again, you see, they take advantage of plate tectonics by, by um, of course, you have this high thermal gradient with percolate and you know, groundwater reaching very fast 200 degrees. So it's, if you think about normal, if you were in Norway or in a normal place, you would have to drill one kilometer to get a 30 degree, you know, it gets hotter when you drill down. It's kind of normal gradient, it's 30 degrees per kilometer, but um, in places there they drilled um, 200 meters and it was 250 degrees, so you get an idea. There are some heat sources down there, which is... That's how we benefit. Yes, so we benefit. Okay. So is it, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. 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 For, for, yeah. My, for my imagination, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so if where the crust is very thin, like yeah. five kilometers, yeah. then you're very be close. Below that, it's already red, burning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Burning. yeah because you're very and close. And it keeps on burning till the other way, until no, til, no, til Australia. No, it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it would be more, um, this is just, uh, it's more in the surface when it's, it's going through decompression. Okay. Uh, in the very deeper, it's, it's just some slowish more, it's probably a few hundred degrees hotter. Uh, so it's, it's just, it cannot be too hot, you see. If you, if you a diamond, to bring them up, you, you cannot come with it. If you put a diamond into, you know, in a, Live volcano, it will ruin it. You know? Yeah, it will ruin it. So it has to.